Welcome to part 42 of our series, Secrets of Glessner House. In this installment, we will explore the iconic Lamont limestone used in the courtyard and will reveal that it technically is not limestone at all. Our examination of the stone begins about 400 million years ago, during the Silurian period of the Paleozoic era. During this time, North America had a very different shape and size, and much of it was covered by shallow seas, as imagined here. Over the course of millions of years, sediment built up on the bottom of the seas and eventually turned into what we now know as limestone and dolostone, the difference between the two lying in their mineral composition. Since both are sedimentary rocks, it is common to find fossils of Paleozoic creatures within the stone. The sugar run formation of Dola Stone was uncovered during the early 1840s as excavation was taking place for the Illinois and Michigan Canal. The most significant discoveries were made southwest of Chicago near the towns of Lamont, circled in red, and Joliet, circled in blue. Joliet became known as Stone City. With the opening of the canal in 1848, it became practical to start shipping the stone to Chicago and other rapidly growing towns. Here we see a typical quarry operation in Joliet, although much of the stone used in Chicago likely came from Lamont as it was closer. Since Lamont was known as Athens in the mid-1840s, the stone became known as Athens marble, although it obviously wasn't marble at all. It was also known as Lamont limestone, Joliet limestone, and Joliet Lamont limestone. Later, it was referred to as dolomite, which is the mineral within the stone. Today, the term dolomite is used to refer to just the mineral, and dolostone is used for the stone itself. The earliest recorded use of this dolostone in Chicago was for the trim and lintels of the Scammon School, located on Madison Street, east of Halstead. It was built in 1846, before the canal was even completed. By the 1850s, the stone was being used to fully clad the exterior of buildings. Here we see the original Chicago High School designed in 1856 by Chicago's first professional architect, John Van Osdell, in partnership with Frederick Bauman. It stood on Monroe Street, east of Halstead. Perhaps the oldest surviving building in Chicago, incorporating the stone, is what is now affectionately known as Old St. Pat's, the Catholic Church at 700 West Adams Street. The building itself is brick, but the stone is used for trim and for the tall base and entry. The most famous structure in Chicago built of Dulles stone is the iconic water tower, as well as the pumping station across the street both constructed in the late 1860s. The stone walls survived the devastation of the Great Chicago Fire in 1871, although the pumping station was completely destroyed inside. The stone remained extremely popular after the fire, especially since the change in building ordinances no longer allowed wooden buildings to be constructed within the city limits. Here we see Holy Name Cathedral, built in 1875 on the 700 block of North State Street. Another survivor is the massive gate that originally marked the entrance into the Chicago Union Stockyards on the south side. It was designed by Burnham and Root in 1879 and remains in place, even though the stockyards closed in 1971. The stone was used for many residences and found its way down to Prairie Avenue. This house, at 1612 South Prairie, was built in 1868. Houses such as these were known as marble fronts, a reference to the stone being called Athens marble. As the stone was expensive to quarry, cut, and install, it was only used on the front of the building, the sides usually being constructed of brick. This is one of three marble front row houses completed in 1869 on the 2000 block of South Prairie Avenue. Thirteen years later, the famous Irish poet and playwright Oscar Wilde was entertained here during his one and only trip to Chicago. The Elbridge Keith House at 1900 South Prairie 
is the only surviving house on the street with a marble front, in this case large slabs of smooth dullest stone. It was also used for the elaborately carved window surrounds. When the Glessners met with Richardson in 1885 to plan their new home, it appears John Glessner suggested using the local Lamont limestone. He wrote in later years, We discussed building material, and I suggested a stone native here and popular at the time. Richardson responded, No, I wouldn't use that. I don't believe it would last a hundred years. Richardson ultimately settled on a type of marble for the main facade and 18th Street elevation, which was chained to granite by the Glessners after he died. That is the subject of another Secrets video. See the link in the description below. But the Lamont limestone John Glessner suggested was ultimately used for three areas of the house. The building specifications called for the foundations to be made from the, quote, best local limestone. There is considerable detail here regarding the size of the stones and how they are to be laid. The foundation is only visible in one area of the courtyard, where a stairway descends to the sub-basement beneath the coach house. This detail shot is taken there. And of course, the foundation walls are visible in the basement itself. The building specifications go on to state that all the stone trim in the courtyard, together with the porches, is to be made from Lamont limestone. Note the misspelling of the name Lamont, which is consistent throughout. Here we see the stone installed around the windows for the dining room. The size of the stones is impressive. Usually the stone would be set in several horizontal courses or rows between the windows, but here, Massive vertical stones extend the full height of the window openings. The largest lintel in the courtyard is this one, which extends over the porch cochere entrance at the east end. Note how it is secured in place on the ends with additional stone supports. Stone was used for all the elements of the curved porch, including the stairs, landings, trim, and the oversized equivalent of the newel post. An interesting feature of the stone can be noticed here. When the stone is freshly cut, it is an off-white or gray color. Over time, the stone oxidizes to its recognizable creamy yellow color due to the presence of small amounts of iron. In this image, the two steps and newel were replaced during the rebuilding of the porch in 1999. They still retain their gray color. The other elements, including the landing, and the surround of the schoolroom windows are original and display the yellow coloration that comes with age. Even though the appearance of the courtyard with its Chicago common brick walls is much simpler than the street elevations, it is still surprising that the Lamont limestone was used here, given Richardson's assertion that the stone would deteriorate over time. This has been the case especially on horizontal surfaces such as windowsills, as limestone will absorb water. The sedimentary layers break down over time, causing the stone to flake off. The use of the stone on the Glessner's home occurred at the very end of its popularity. Having been used for nearly 40 years by the time the house was built, its tendency to deteriorate was being noticed. By the 1890s, architects and builders had switched to the use of a new limestone that was quarried in the south central region of Indiana. That stone, properly known as Salem limestone, is commonly called Indiana limestone or Bedford limestone, the latter a reference to the town closest to the quarries. The Kimball House at 1801 South Prairie Avenue, directly across from the Glessner House, was completed in 1892 and is an excellent example of the use of Bedford limestone. Note how uniform the gray color is and how crisp the intricate stone carving is 130 years after it was executed. Lamont limestone was called for in one other place at Glessner House for the sidewalks, the originals of which have long since disappeared, no doubt due to their deterioration through years of rain and snow. During the late 1970s, 
when the Prairie Avenue Historic District was created, new stone sidewalks were installed, although Valder's Dollar Stone was used, its source being a quarry near the small town of Valder's, about 70 miles north of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. The building specifications note that the slabs of stone were to be huge, for example, to accommodate the eight-foot width of the main sidewalk on Prairie Avenue, and the slabs were a full six inches thick. One foot of sand beneath provided a stable foundation. In this early view of the front entrance, we can see the huge slabs of limestone in the foreground, which in this area were 11 feet in width. These slabs would have weighed around three tons, so one can imagine the difficulty of transporting and setting them into place in the days before mechanized equipment. An excellent source of information for learning more about limestone, dollar stone, and all the various types of stone used in Chicago buildings is Chicago in Stone and Clay, a guide to the Windy City's architectural geology, written by Raymond Wiggers and published in 2022 by Cornell University. Selected information in this video was taken from that book. We hope you have enjoyed learning more about the history and uses of Lamont limestone, or more correctly, Dulles stone, a popular building material in 19th century Chicago that found its way into the courtyard at Glessner House. Tune in next time when another secret will be revealed.